So this morning we have this passage from Luke, three different stories really about prayer, right? The first one is something that we all rec- should have recognized, right? It's different though, isn't it? It's not the way we pray it. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be, right? It's missing some stuff. And that part down there about forgive us our sins as we forgive those who are indebted to us. It's a little bit different. Why? Because the Lord's Prayer that we use normally, that we're going to say a little bit later in the service, comes from Matthew. Not from Luke, but Luke has this there. Luke then has this section about this man who goes and knocks on his friend's door and says, I have a friend who just showed up at midnight and I have to feed him and I don't have any food. And then it has this section on ask and you'll receive, seek and you'll find, knock and it will be open to you. Which is very interesting, right? Because basically this says that if you ask for it, you're going to get it. If you look for it, you're going to find it. If you knock on it, it's going to be opened. Does it say anything about believing in what you're, what you're doing? Luke says nothing here about belief involved with prayer. Which begs the question, right? How many of you have ever asked for something of God and didn't get it? Right? Luke clearly says here, if you ask for it, what? You will, you will receive it. You will find it. You'll find it. Luke's not very clear on what it is, though. So we think it's what we asked for, but it may not be. So what is prayer? And why should we do it if God doesn't answer? Why should we pray? I mean, that's a, to, for me right now, that's an honest question. I mean, look at everything that's happening in our, in, not in the world, in our country. How many police officers have been shot down in cold blood over the last month? It seems like every time I turned around, I was looking at some, something else that was happening online that is just audacious and shouldn't be happening. It's amazing to me. The lack of respect for human life that's happening today in our country. So why should we pray? Because I know there's people praying about all of this and it does it seem to be doing any good. Not now. So that's the that's the next thing we get to, right, is what what are the answers to prayer? If if we're talking about praying and not getting an answer for prayer, are, is there more than one answer for prayer? Right. If I ask God for something and he doesn't give it to me, what are the answers that are possible? There's and, and I've always heard and this doesn't help the matter at all, that there's three answers for prayer. Right. It's the same three answers that a parent gives a child when that child asks the parent for something, right? right? So kids, I need your help here. What are the three things that mom and dad say to you when you say, I want this new whatever. I want this new TV. The answer is? No, it could be. What's the first one? It could be? No. It could be? Yes. Or it could be? Maybe. Or we'll see. Right. And maybe or we'll see is the politically correct way that a parent can say in the store, there's no way you're going to get this. <laughs> Just not going to happen. Right. And that's those are the answers that God gives us for prayer, too. When you ask God for something, the answer is yes, no, or we'll see. Not yet. Maybe. And when when a parent says that to a child, why is the parent saying that? And it's a little bit different here. We'll get to this. But when a parent said, when I say it to my child, my first thought is, can we actually afford what it is that they want? Of course, that's not a question that crosses God's mind. God can afford whatever God wants to do. So God, there's no cost for God. But God thinks about it. You know, it's like if someone asks for a new rifle, my daughter asks for a new, my 15 year old asks for a new rifle. My thought would be is. Is she ready for it? Does she know the implications of what could happen with this? 
Has she thought through the processes of everything that's going to, that could possibly happen, right? As a parent, you work through all the worst case scenarios in your mind when your child asks you for something, right? So, do they, are they really ready for this? When you ask God for something, are you really ready for this? And does that really help the matter when we're, when we're asking God to end the violence in the, in the country and it seems like nothing is happening? The answers to these prayer, is God really mulling over in his mind? Are they ready for there to be peace on earth? I, it just seems kind of strange to me that God would be thinking that. So why should we pray? Why should we take the time to go to God and ask these questions? Right. Because yes, no, and maybe really doesn't help. Because if you ask the question to God, God, will you heal my insert name of family member here of cancer? And how many of us don't show hands? How many of us have done that? Right. We've all been there. We've all done that. We've all asked God to heal somebody that we love of something and it hasn't happened. And here's the twist on that. And this doesn't help that much either. And I learned this from a man who should have been dead. What, four years ago? Uh, the former pastor at the congregation I served in Texas was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease or ALS. Normally you get two years to live with ALS. The man's now been alive for seven years with ALS. Um, but through that process of, of meeting him and, and becoming his friend and walking with him on part of this journey, I've learned that healing doesn't come the way that we always think it's going to come. See, we ask for God to heal this person and make them be the way that they were when we knew them long ago, right? But God has a way of doing things that don't always line up with our lives and our thought processes. And that healing can come in a different way than we first thought. And it, to me, it's really about our understanding of what prayer is and how God interacts with our lives, and how God calls us to be His children, His hands and feet, moving through this world, to not only bring about His, His mission and ministry, to show forth His love and grace and mercy, but to bring about the changes that need to happen in order for His will to be seen as the predominant will that's happening in the world. You see, there's one thing that we miss in this whole set of verses because of a bad translation. And it's a, about our understanding of prayer. Right? What is prayer? I asked the kids up here. Is it me sitting in here every morning on my knees, kneeling down and looking up at this, at the cross and praying? Is that what prayer is? Or sitting in a chair all by myself, contemplating life and talking to God? Maybe it's sitting by the fire and, and watching the flames lick and move and, and, and wander and thinking about the great wonders that God has created for us. It's spending time in solitude, but yet it's also something more. Because prayer cannot be just sitting in a sanctuary with your hands folded and your eyes closed looking up because Paul told Timothy, pray without ceasing. So if we're supposed to be always in prayer, prayer cannot be sitting in the sanctuary talking to God alone. Jesus went off and prayed by himself, and that needs to happen. But there's more to it than that. See, there's this one little word in verse 8 in our, in our lessons this morning. It says that um, pers persistence, right? He was persistent. It says that the man will get up, and he will get up not because he wants to, not because he has to, right? He tells his friend, I'm not getting up because I'm already in bed and everybody's asleep. He says, but then I tell you, even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence. Persistence. He will get up because of his persistence. Not because he's his friend. I mean, we do things all the time for our friends, right? You call upon your friends. I know there's just this last week with the storm we had, there was people that called upon friends from this congregation. I saw pictures of what y'all did online with the massive um, trees that got taken down and moved off of someone's mound system. Um, but not because he's his friend, but because of his persistence. And the key word there is persistence, which, which is mistranslated. It comes from two words in the Greek. And the, well, it's one word, but it's two words put together, right? The first word means to feel shame or to be ashamed, to respect or to have reverence for. And the other word is the prefix to that word, which is an, which is a negation. 
which means to not feel shame, to not have reverence. So really this word here, when he says he will get up, not because he is his friend, but because of his persistence, really it should be because of his insolence or because of his audacity or because of his impudence or his shamelessness. Impudent. How many of you know what the word impudent means? Such a beautiful word. Anyone? Anyone? I got a couple of hands way in the back. Impudence. Impudent. I looked it up because I didn't know either. So, (laughs) but now that I know I'm going to use this word. Impudent is a failing to show proper respect and courtesy or very rude. Or it could be, um, obsolete answer is lacking of modesty or marked with contemptuous or cocky, boldness or disregard of others. He's impudent because of his impudence, because of the man's impudence, because of his lack of respect for the fact that this man was in bed with his children. The lights were off. The doors were locked. Yet he still comes and knocks on the door. Why? Because he has a friend that needs to be fed. And that's enough motivation for him to go to his to his friend's house and wake him up in the middle of the night. He's so shameful in what he does. And as you were listening this morning to to the Genesis reading, did you hear that? Of Moses in the Sodom and Gomorrah story? Moses goes to God and says, right? He goes to God and goes, God says, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah because of the, the, the sin that they've committed. And we can get into what the sin is that Sodom and Gomorrah committed later. It's a whole nother sermon. But... Because of the sin that they committed, I'm going to to destroy the city. And Moses goes, but wait a minute, God. What if there's 50 people there that are still following you and doing what you've called them to do? Are you going to destroy those 50 too? And God goes, well, okay, for 50 people. And, And that's not enough for Moses, right? So Moses whittles him down to 10, right? 45, 40, 30, 20. It's, it's cocky, Right? Moses is standing before God and going, I know that you're the creator and you've done everything and you're going to do what you want to, but if there's just 10 people there, are you still going to destroy the whole city? How many of you have ever done something like that? I got a couple people that are raising their hands. That's I want to hear some stories later. <laughs> But prayer is not just us sitting here and doing our thing, raising our, our, our wants up to God, giving Him all the stuff that we think should happen. It's not sending a mes- message off in a bottle. It's not sealing a letter in an envelope and sending it off. It's not sending an email out to somebody. It's more than that. You see, prayer, as my seminary professor Mark Vitalis Hoffman said, prayer is not a time to put all of your bags into one asket. Did you get that? I'll say it again, slower, so you'll get it. Prayer is not a time to put all of your bags into one asket. It's not a time for you to just tell God everything that you want to happen and then just sit back and wait for it to happen. Sometimes we have to wait on prayer, but sometimes we can be proactive in what happens in prayer. Rather than praying for somebody who is lonely, why don't we go visit them? Instead of praying for an end to violence, why don't we do something about it? Let's stand up against injustices. When police officers use too much of their power to do things they shouldn't be doing, we need to stand up against that. But we also need to go to police stations and pray for those officers that are doing what they need to be doing and reminding them that we're here and supporting them and that we want them to do what God has called them to do. Right? It's about us standing up for the injustices in the world. It's not just saying, God, bring peace. What can we do to bring peace? What can we do to help end the violence that's happening in the world? What can we do to stop loneliness? What can we do to stop hunger? What can we do to stop hatred? And here's my challenge for you. And I've said this to council before, I know. And I've said this to other groups before. We always talk about how we say we're going to pray for somebody. Somebody comes up to you and tells you something that they have that's going on in their lives, right? Um, you know, I'm trying to think of something that happened just this past week for me. 
Pray for, you know, someone just lost their father a few, a few weeks ago. So pray for that person. And rather than just telling that person you're going to pray for them, pray for them on the spot. Say you run into somebody in Woodman. And they say, you know, you ask them, what's going on? What's happening? And they tell you, you know, I just found out that my mother has, you know, this, this going on. She's going to be going to surgery and, and, and it'd be nice if, you know, because I know you go to church, if you could pray for me. And rather than telling them, I'll pray for you, pray for them. Don't wait. Do it right there, right then. Have you ever seen anybody praying in the middle of Woodman's? What kind of a witness is that to the world? If we can take these small steps and be shameless about our faith, and be audacious about our faith, impudent is kind of a weird word to use with that because it's not crude. Um, it's, but that's the sense of it, right? It's something that goes against what society thinks should happen. Because these are things that we should do in, in these spaces, not in those spaces out there. But you know what? This is not a space confined to God. God does not dwell here in this box and not out anywhere else in the world. God is at Woodman's. God is at the harbor. God is at Archie's. Right? There's nowhere you can go that God's not going to be there. So there's no reason why we can't pray everywhere we go. So my challenge to you for this week is to when somebody asks you to pray for them, don't say, I'll pray for you. Pray for them. And do it shamelessly. Live your faith out loud because that's what we're called to do. And if we're ever going to have change in this country, it's going to have to be because we, the ones that are following after Jesus and trying to live as disciples of Christ, are actually doing what he's called us to do, which is not just sit in a room locked up giving him praise, but actually going out into the world and using our hands and feet to give him to give everyone the love that he's given to us. So live your faith out loud and live it shamelessly. Because He will increase the wonderfulness of your life and show forth His love to everyone else as we go and live our faith out loud.